I'm an outsider to Youngstown. I came here 16 months ago as a Strong City, Strong Communities Fellow. So now, I guess you could call me an inside outsider. It's okay, you can laugh. <laughs> this afternoon, I'd like you to think about some of my inside-outsider questions for innovation and development in Youngstown as a city and the Mahoning Valley as a region. We all know that cities and suburbs, municipalities and townships are like oil and water, right? So time for true confessions, just between us. Although I consider myself an urbanist, I grew up in a township just outside the city limits of Dayton, a community that has many things in common with Youngstown. I know all about living outside the city. I grew up in a place immersed in the rationale to separate cities from suburbs and municipalities from townships. But I also spent a lot of time downtown. I went to a downtown high school, and my after-school job was with a downtown business. I came to love cities, and through time, I've spent my entire adult life in them. Now suburbs are also experiencing the challenges of core cities. First-ring suburbs have declined, as the population has moved further and further from city centers. So suburban areas are no longer the panacea once envisioned. Let's talk about how this division came about in America. Culturally, Americans embraced the idea of the little cabin in the woods, the Henry David Thoreau, Walden Pond view of living independently. But to build a nation, we needed cities in addition to countryside. Throughout history, cities have been places where people gather to exchange ideas, to conduct commerce, for economic opportunity, and for cultural enrichment. But cities also became places that were crowded, congested, noisy, and polluted. Places that were unhealthy, where disease was easily spread. And as recently as 110 years ago, New York City dwellers lived seven years less than non-city dwellers. Suburbs sprang up as a result of negative perceptions about cities. In response to city challenges, in the mid and late 1800s in America, we began to create green respites within cities. Places like New York City's Central Park and Youngstown's amazing Mill Creek Park. These designed landscapes were referred to as the lungs of the city, fresh air in the midst of industry. Other innovations over time made cities safer and healthier as well. In the mid-19th century, we discovered the link between overcrowded, unsanitary housing and epidemics such as cholera. Great advances were made in public health and city planning, most importantly, safe drinking water. Clean air standards in the 20th century made U.S. cities healthier as well. Our city's industry, air, and water became cleaner, and now New York City residents live on average two years longer than other Americans, largely because they get more exercise by walking more and driving less. Often, crime in cities is cited as a concern. Yet, 40,000 people die in roadway accidents in the United States each year, 30% more 
than die from guns. But the negative perceptions of the city remain, and many people prefer suburbs. However, now we have an economy based on intellectual capital and the interaction of people and ideas. Today, living and working in a place with a denser population is no longer a disadvantage. It's now an advantage. Today, the younger generation wants active lifestyles, and increasingly, my generation wants choices as well. Choices for transportation that include walking, biking, transit, and cars when necessary. Today, more people want to be close to where they work. They want nearby recreation, entertainment, and dining. And companies, in turn, are responding to what the workforce wants. Cities, walkable neighborhoods, and real downtowns but not necessarily the nostalgic downtowns that are the older generation remembers and misses. Just as downtown retail is no longer the king, suburban shopping centers are losing market share as customers move to online retail. Our downtowns can be vibrant again, but they'll be different than they were in the past. However, this remaking does not need to be inauthentic. Authenticity is honoring those things that are special about your community, including reusing and redeveloping older buildings. Asheville, North Carolina's downtown 25 years ago was full of vacant and abandoned buildings. And then in 1991, a community leader be who believed that revitalizing the downtown was the key to the prosperity of the whole region began to rehab these buildings. Offices, residences, retail, entertainment, etc. This effort was sustained over two decades by this community leader and his successors. And now, downtown Asheville is the focal point of the community with 24-7 activities and functions. So the first question I'd like you to think about is, what are the authentic characteristics of Youngstown that you want to retain and build upon? In Asheville's case, using the authenticity of the downtown historic area, also capitalized on, on the spatial economics of development. Let's compare downtown Asheville's economic performance to a suburban big box development. Downtown delivers more than 10 times the jobs and nearly 100 times the tax revenue per acre of the downtown development. And Asheville's downtown is of modest scale. These spatial economics work with downtown buildings of even two or three stories. In fact, sprawled out big box development can cost more in public services and infrastructure than it delivers in tax revenue. The best value for the public is to use existing infrastructure or develop new developments more compactly. Further, local businesses help to retain more dollars within the community than their national uh, chain counterparts. This is due to local businesses being more likely to use local suppliers, advertisers, printers, accountants, attorneys, etc., while national chains typically send this work out of town or, and use agglomerated back office services. The return of people to downtowns and main streets is happening in Ohio cities and towns as well. 
Some examples are downtown Worcester, the short north in Columbus, and Gordon Square in Cleveland. Each of these has been a work in progress for decades. In downtown Youngstown, arts and cultural organizations contributed positively even in the most challenging economic times. And in recent years, new apartments and restaurants have opened in older buildings. These are all positive signs. But for downtown Youngstown to fully recover, a consistent, thoughtful effort will be required. And the 1960s approach of tearing down buildings to put in more surface parking lots will not result in a successful downtown. The key competitive advantage of cities today is the ability to attract and retain people and enable them to collaborate in ways that are unique to each successful city. According to Harvard economist Edward Glazer, cities are our species' greatest invention, and cities magnify human strengths. Density leads to vital ideas and creative innovation, all spurred by face-to-face -face interaction. Cities allow businesses to attract talent and sharpen that talent. An excellent example is the Youngstown Business Incubator. This downtown Youngstown hub is a carefully curated collection of 30 companies in various stages of development and employing 500 people, creating synergy. Each company's presence helps all the others advance in ways that can't be forced. Things happen serendipitously in the hallways, over coffee, at lunch, or at the nearby pub or wine bar. As issues and opportunities arise, an expert is available right there. It happens because of the gathering of people who are working on analogous challenges. Competitive cities around the world are fostering this concept through innovation districts. In Youngstown, we can support the expansion of one of the world's best innovation districts. Another key for successful cities is the ability to reinvent. The older a city is, the more times it has had to reinvent itself. Take Boston, for example. Imagine if Boston had stayed stuck on its early industry trading in whale oil. It would not be economically viable today. Boston emphasized education, helping the city recreate itself multiple times over the centuries. It was a trading port with Europe and the West Indies in the 17th century, and then it became a manufacturing center in the 1850s. And a century later, Boston is a biotechnology, high-tech, and education center. Similarly, Columbus, Ohio, once a buggy manufacturing capital of the world, has learned how to retool and take on new industries and new lines of business. Now Columbus is diversified in research, insurance, banking, distribution, and education. In order to reinvent, cities need to diversify. They need to become more flexible, and they need to focus on creative and technical skills. Today, success or failure at developing human capital is why some older industrial cities have continued to decline while others have reinvented and rebounded. Ask yourselves, what will Youngstown reinvent itself to become? Today, suburbs and cities 
have to work together as regions. The days of cities and suburbs distrusting each other have to be over. The places that are succeeding are succeeding as metropolitan regions. Successful regions have healthy cores. Ultimately, the whole region will fail if its center dies. A question for you to consider is, what will it take for greater Youngstown to knit itself together? In regenerating America's legacy cities, the authors provide a number of recommendations for older industrial cities like Youngstown. One recommendation that is critical to the Youngstown region is creating cross-jurisdictional partnerships among local governments for more efficient service delivery and more effective economic development efforts. A second important recommendation is to revitalize the central core as a first step. This can be accomplished through collaborative efforts of the city and major institutions such as colleges, universities, medical centers, and other major employers. Pooling resources toward a shared vision for the central core is critical. A third key recommendation is to be selective and prioritize. Focus resources on sustaining the viable city neighborhoods. Scattering resources thinly across the whole city won't make an impact and ultimately won't be effective at saving any neighborhoods. A fourth key concept is repurposing disinvested neighborhoods. In cities with a large loss of population such as Youngstown, there are areas with only a few residents. Those residents may elect to stay in their neighborhood, while the already vacant properties may need to take on a more rural character with uses such as woodlands, green infrastructure, and urban agriculture. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about our overall role as citizens. According to Charles Montgomery, author of Happy City, people are happier when they live an engaged life, connected to their community, when they are true citizens and not just consumers or taxpayers. In communities around the world, citizen engagement is being fostered through community conversations, some big, some small. Locally, your public library is using the Harwood method of conversation to engage citizens in its strategic planning process. In closing, I'd like you to think about the unique and special community you inherited a community built over two centuries. Yes, things have been tough. Time has marched on and the world has changed. So be innovators. Engage in your community. Build partnerships to knit the region together. My final question for you is this. Ask yourselves how, collectively, you can advance the community while respecting Youngstown's unique heritage and special character. Thank you.